implies that we don't just melt away into the great oneness, into the all, to, to the, the one great big blob. Um, what about the eternal validity of the soul and individuality, these great masters? Um, they're individuating, are they not? They are... You, you, can, you cannot develop spiritually without a self. An individuated self. Absolutely, you cannot. A soul personality. Absolutely, you cannot develop without it. God doesn't want us to just melt back into him, her, whatever. I think the question is, what does that really mean? I what, think, what does it mean? Yeah, exactly. I think that, when pe that there's a lot of confusion. I, when you translate, forgive me, but when you translate tr cross-culturally, there's always going to be uh, some form of misunderstanding. I, and I'm just going to make a caveat for the listeners because I'm teaching, uh, I'm actually functioning, uh, training people just about every major religion without them changing their religion. I mean, when I teach somebody, I, 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 don't, I don't have any followers. I'm not teaching one religion or one way. I'm interested in the person and what works for them and what is their path. And I, there's just a lot of confusion. When you take a Hindu concept, something out of Sanskrit, which for most people has already been translated into their native language, which means you've already lost a chunk of it to begin with. You bet. And then you get all the cross-cultural differences. Um, I feel like, uh, since I'm teaching students in so many different cultures, I feel like I come up short all the time. I, I'm constantly working with them for them to really teach me culturally, because I'm going to have a bias, and my bias is I am a Berkeley Jew. <laughs> Okay. Yeah, it's a bias. It's it's it's. I'm a I'm typical. Uh, I talk like I'm from California. I talk fast like I'm from California. Forgive me, listeners. <laughs> you know, it's just I, I look like it. My hand movements are like it. Um, you look like a hippie a little bit. Yeah, right? exactly. And you know, I'm a 65 and a half year old hippie. <laughs> and yes, I pay my bills, and I I've, I've raised three children, and I have a wonderful marriage, and blah blah blah. But I'm still. This is what I came from. And why not? Wouldn't I be eclectic spiritually? Coming from Berkeley, you right? Can. Exactly. So it, it, it's just there's a bias. And I think that we suffer from uh, the fact that we have such an extraordinary exposure to different uh, views uh, of things, and then suffering from translation, and then suffering from trying to construct something uh, more based on our mind conceiving of an idea, which then creates the experience, and then we validating our experience by the idea we started with, which may have nothing to do with anything to begin with. And many of us are suffering from this not having a teacher, which happened to me when my one teacher died between a year and a half between Kerpal, Lou, and Hilda, was a disaster. <laughs> me trying to put together an understanding of what was going on. So, And I'm not advertising for people to find a teacher, but I just think that we all suffer from this. This is a natural state of the human condition. So what it means to be absorbed in the divine doesn't mean to lose anything of this world in the sense of being able to function here. The question is, what's the perspective? Is it the perspective of unity? Is it the perspective of distinction within unity? Or is it the perspective of separation? And no. that's the difference between God consciousness and ego consciousness. Yes, yes. That's it. And absorbed in something doesn't mean losing in distinction. It means being able to receive within the distinction. Yes. The divine will. Hmm. And that's it's a very simple, a simple concept. The divine will uh, is that the equivalent of our own true will? Yes, I think you could call it that. I think that we, since we come from the divine will by nature, we are within the creation, we're part of the creation, then we aren't separated from it. So it is our true will. But, in the, but we, we, we struggle to return to that state because through history and through conditioning and through the environment that we are brought into, we have to harness our humanness, our humanity to divine will and to leave um, the part of us that would only be thinking about ourselves. And that's the journey, that's the journey we all and once we harness our will, that doesn't mean we have to be vig stop being vigilant. We have to always remember uh, the experience of the, of the other. I have to remember you. I have to remember you who are listening. And, and honestly, 
They're watching. You're watching, and I and I'm looking mostly at Eliyahu because I can only see a camera, a red camera, and the, fortunately I can see the face of Jesus across from me. I see uh -huh. my beloved Daphne who's sitting on a couch, and you can't see her, but it's um, this right. We're actually in the living experience right now of remembering. I have to keep remembering you. It's easier for me to remember you than it is for me to remember all of you. And I keep having to, to bring that back into my consciousness. This is not a camera sitting in front of me. It's all of you out there who have, have come to this moment to, to enter into this dialogue with Eliyahu and myself. Or I'm entering into this dialogue with you, except you don't have a name. Maybe, maybe it's you that I'm listening to. Uh -huh. Do you understand? It's not, it's not as separate as we might perceive it or I might perceive it. And I have to wake up and remember this. We have to keep waking up. It's you, not automatic. You say waking up. And actually reality is sort of just, some people will say that it's sort of a mass hypnosis. And you know, hypnosis is a fascinating thing. I've just been watching a lot of David Wilcock. I don't know if you know who he is. I do, I do. Um, brilliant stuff on his uh, website, I find it brilliant, uh, divinecosmos.com, he's got these free films. Um, he talks about uh, mass hypnosis. For instance, there's a very it's, uh, uh, well known and true story. A man hypnotizes a father and he gives him a, a, a suggestion. He says to the father, uh, a post hypnotic suge suggestion, when you come out of the hypnosis, <laughs> You won't be able to see your daughter, even if she's, you won't be able to see her. Um, and um, and it, it will last a certain while. There was no, as far as I could tell, there was no bad intent at all. He was trying to, to prove something to an audience. So um, he takes him out of hypnosis, and the daughter is right there giggling standing in front of him, the father doesn't see her. And he's asked, well, do you see your daughter around anywhere? And he can't see his daughter. She's standing right in front of him. He takes out, uh, at a certain point, he, he, he takes out um, a pocket watch with an inscription. He holds the, uh, the, the back of the pocket watch with the inscription, um, right behind the daughter who's standing right in front of the father. And he asks the father what, what he sees in front of him. And the father answers he sees a pocket watch. Not only does he see the pocket watch, which he's never seen before, he doesn't know about it, he's able to read the inscription of the pocket watch which is written on the, on the back of it. You see, in other words, he sees through his daughter. And um, so what's coming up here is the question of what is reality? Is this chair that we're sitting on, the chairs that we're sitting on, the room that we're sitting in, apparently it's just an agreed upon concept that we've been trained to be able to, to feel and to see. And um, it, it's, it's a density, it's a frequency. This chair, his daughter, mm -hmm. is uh, vibrating at frequency density, a vibration of frequency density. And he was hypnotized in, in uh, not being able to see that density of what, which is his daughter, that frequency. And so he doesn't see her. Um, so what is reality? Aren't we all creating a mutual reality all the time? Um, they say that when the conquistadors came to South America, this is, there are many stories of this, the natives couldn't see the ships. And only when the ships came really, really close and one of their shamans was able to, to, to see the ship, and then he would describe it to the people. Well, you know, there's something out there, and it's really strange, but it looks like this, and this, and this, and this, and only then could the people see the, the ships of the, the Spanish. So 
what is reality and where is it going? We've, we've built this uh, agreed upon world and I think it's changing big time right now. Everybody says so. The Mayans say so. Uh, all kinds of prophecies from all kinds of peoples all over the world say so, that it's changing big time. So what is reality, Nora? And uh, what world are we going to create next? And uh, do you have any of... Well, I, I, you know, I, I don't know, the, you know, specifically about... I, what you're describing to me is not at all uh, unfamiliar. And um, we can and do know from science that the amount of matter, for example, if we were to condense it for a human, would be a very tall, small size P, maybe on, on the end of a pin. And that would be um, maybe all the, the matter as of you or me uh, could be condensed to that, and even within that matter there's space. So ultimately, what we're talking about is what we perceive as solid is organized space. And so, I myself personally, uh, during the early stages of my development, have, have had perceived and seen through what is, would be considered solid matter. Um, Sai Baba was famous for standing in the middle of a pillar. Um, masters have been known to walk through walls. Right. Yes. Yeah, so it's true. And I, that's, that's completely conceivable that a person could c uh, come out of a state, of a hypnotic state, and may not perceive something that is, um, would be recognized as solid for another person in the room and not actually perceive it. Uh, I don't have a problem with that. I, I don't necessarily, I don't think it's, I don't know if we can actually describe or define reality uh, on, on terms like that. I think that there's a, um, an evolution, uh, an, unfold, an unfoldment of, which unfoldment actually is not a word, unfold is, but I like to say unfoldment. Of, uh, <laughs> of, of, of human consciousness and um, the representation of this in the physical world. And I don't think it's a static process. I think that um, we each can, how we, how we organize our lives and how we organize our thought and how we organize our feeling, uh, as we come under t to live d more deeply inside of compassion and love and trust and Truth and all of the basic qualities that I would say are the are the principles of of, of the great religions, uh, the principles that don't produce separations but produce unity. I think that we have an opportunity to um, to see a, a shift in, in the environment around us. And if we do not come under these these spiritual guidelines or ways of living, we will see a a disintegration of the culture around us and the beauty and the harmony. Um, Wouldn't you agree it'll be a disintegration before a reintegration of something new? I don't know because the divine is not logical and linear. So I mean that would be a logical and linear thought, but uh, the world of the divine doesn't necessarily follow uh, any of that. So how something would happen or not happen may or may not happen in a time sequence or before and after. The world of unity does not have number, does not have levels, and doesn't have before and after. So I couldn't say, and we've had enough things that we believe happen almost timelessly, like that some of these things that happened um, before the human as we know it existed. Um, we, I can't say, I couldn't say, but what I'm more interested in is not what's to come. What I'm interested in is how I can be of service in the, it, right here and now in this moment, how can I affect in a positive way, um, the people that I meet on a daily basis, no matter where they are, in the supermarket, on the train, the plane, the subway, the person who opens up the door in a hotel, um, how can I be a person with it? When I walk past that person, that I have a, a healthy uh, human experience. In other words, that I, I am in healthy interaction with that human being in a, in a way that promotes life and balance and harmony for them. Well, what advice could you give us so that we could live in that way where every interaction we have is as much as possible 
positive and serving and loving um, and uh, well and, and of course we're not always there sometimes no. we don't feel good That's sometimes right. we're, we get angry it's a work in progress every day in so, every moment so what advice can you give us to, to be the best people we could be I think probably, which may sound kind of non-linear, I would say that most of what you think and feel that's negative has nothing to do with you, and you need to remember that. Ah. And I think if you can remember that, because we do, sometimes do generate these thoughts, but actually my experience is that about 98 or 99 percent of most of what we experience has been generated by someone else. So if you can remember yourself in the midst of that, I think you're going to experience a lot of liberation and self-love. Um, again, about David Wilcock, he talks exactly about this in the film I just saw, which is called, the film is called The Source Field Investigation. It's on his website, it's, you could also Google uh, that on YouTube. And he says this, this source field, which is a consciousness field, which is uh, a, the universal mind. And we're all connected like in this universal, this, what they call the world tree. And everybody's thoughts influences everybody else, uh, else's thoughts. And, uh, and the creator, who is also uh, who is us, also, um, that we can connect with this. The source field, its quality is love. It's a cry, on, cry on calls it the love source. Uh, and so it's all influencing us. We could, the more we can be in tuned, attuned to the source field, the more loving and peaceful we could be. But everybody's thoughts is influencing everybody. Um, and he also says that um, the more harmonious, though, is the stronger influence. It's true, I may have neighbors. That's true. I may have neighbors who are angry or jealous or whatever, but even if there's one uh, neighbor who's loving and kind, that's more powerful than any of the other stuff. Um, and so we can, we can hopefully bring that into the world. Um, You're going to have to forgive me, but my beloved here, Daphne, who brought me, has to go and pick up her daughter at school. Okay, good. I knew. <laughs> so I'm going to I'm gonna to need to go. You have to forgive me, everyone. I knew it had to come to an end And uh, we can do it again. I'll be back in Israel in, in April, God willing. I'll be here. Uh, any last comments? Nope, Nora. that's it. It's just that uh, thank you for the opportunity and the honor to uh, to do this with you, and I always love seeing you. And I think it's very neutral. I think you're a great inspiration to us all. Well, thank you. We all. You're your own teacher. <laughs> okay, I do my best. We all do our best. Thank you very much. Thank, thank you, Nora. Thank you.